you'll open your Bibles to the wonderful book of Esther in chapter number 3. We'll have a brief reading here and then turn to an even briefer reading in chapter number 6 of the same book. Our lesson today is on the hedge. We're looking at an invisible spiritual blessing that we may not know much about that's a wonderful asset for us to have as we serve God in the kingdom. To be a child of God and have Him as our protector, our God. That's what this lesson is about. In chapter 3 of Esther, God's people are facing some very adverse situations. Haman has been elevated by the king, promoted, and he now thinks he's worthy of being worshipped. He issues a decree, and the king signs off on it, that when Haman enters the courts, when you see him, you bow down as if to worship. Well, as you can imagine, that doesn't sit well with the Jews. They have their own God, they have their own laws and customs, and they refuse to pay homage to Mr. Haman. And it creates a whale of a problem for the Jews because this egotistical maniac is so upset about you not worshiping me that he seeks to have a decree issued by the king to commit genocide and have all of the Jewish people in his land executed. In chapter 3, starting verse 2, And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him, but Mordecai, a Jew, would not bow or pay homage. And the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command?" Now it happened when they spoke to him daily, he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with wrath, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. Now let's go in our lesson today to chapter number 6, and we'll read verse 13. It looks like the Jews, who are weak compared to the inhabitants of the land, the Jews are exiles living in this land, are facing certain death. But God has a hedge around His people, and He will not allow certain things to happen to them. He's going to protect them. And in verse 13, Esther 6, when Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. You can't have your way with these people. They're not like us. They're Jewish people. They have a different God, and they have a God who protects them. And that's what we want to look at today. Does God protect us? Does He build a hedge around us? To be a child of God and have Him as our protector is such a lucrative thing to think about. Let's first of all start by going to the physical world and find out what a hedge is and what service it provides and then we'll be better able to make an application when we talk about the spiritual hedge that applies to us. Smith's Bible Dictionary says a hedge denotes that which surrounds or encloses, whether it be a stone wall or a fence or other materials. That's what a hedge is. International Bible Dictionary says hedges were often made 
of cut thorn branches or thorny bushes which were very common in the Jordan Valley. These thorny bushes would grow to about man's height. They were very circular and thick and they were known for producing thorns two to three inches long. And the Jews and the Israelites would cut these bushes down just above the ground and drag them to the vineyard or whatever private piece of property they wanted to protect. And they would stack them up like dominoes one after another around this protected area. And you couldn't penetrate that area because the bushes were too thick and because they had thorns on them. And they protected a certain territory. Hedges were as prevalent in Bible times as fences are in our society. And they accomplished the same thing. Protection. Notice the symbolism. Hedges kept things outside from getting inside. That will be a good spiritual application for us in a moment. They were designed to keep out thieves most commonly, but they were also designed to keep wildlife from nibbling on your cash flow. And if you've ever had blueberries or grapes or strawberries, you know how wildlife like coons and deer and birds can come into your vineyard and wipe you out overnight. <laughs> In Matthew chapter 21, verse 33, Jesus writes about the hedge. Here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it. It was deliberately set around the vineyard. He dug a wine press in the hedge and built a tower. The hedge is designed to provide security. Jesus taught about it. The physical hedge has an invisible partner. It's like a spiritual hedge, if you will, built by God. It's a hedge he builds around the people who live in the kingdom that those citizens might be protected from evil or Satan. In Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 5 on the screen, and now please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. This is God speaking to the prophet. He likens his kingdom or his church to a vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it shall be burned. And I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled. God's people weren't living according to his ways. They had fallen into idol worship. So he's going to remove the hedge. Man couldn't see it, but God was providentially protecting his vineyard from every adversity that his people weren't capable of standing up against. Now what about a hedge for idol worship? Well, you don't need a hedge for that. You ought to know the difference between right and wrong. You've been commanded by Moses in the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You don't need a hedge to protect you from every little tiny temptation that comes along. There are some things that God's people can take care of on their own. But let's leave idol worship, which can easily be dealt with, and talk about the Babylonians or the Assyrians or these large empires that could come against you any time. They have more horses and more chariots, and they could easily wipe out God's people, and he built a hedge around them to protect them from such cases. Let's turn to the book of Job. Right near Esther, next book in the Bible, we're going to read the first 11 verses. This is probably the most famous place in the scriptures where we see the hedge. Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people in the east. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course, 
that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, and thus Job did regularly. Let's pause for just a moment. Job is such a spiritual and faithful man that he's concerned about the sins his sons might have committed. That's how much he's in tune with God's will. Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? Satan answered and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Satan didn't know Job as well as God did. But he knows some things that I'd like for us to point out this morning. First of all, he knows about the head. It appears he's desired to wreak havoc upon Job and couldn't get to him because of the hedge. He knew that God built the hedge and that's why he couldn't penetrate it. Luke 4 verse 41, And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. I just want to pull one thing out of that verse. The Son of God has so much power that he could rebuke the demons and keep them from speaking. Satan knew that God built the hedge. He said so with his own mind. Have you not made a hedge around him? He's protected by you. That's why I can't do anything with him. Next, Satan knew the hedge protected Job. It seems that he's been trying to find a way to get through the hedge and has been rejected. And the question is, when we look at the way a hedge works in the first or the oldest book in the Bible, the book of Job, the question is, do we have a hedge around us? Does God protect us? If so, from whom or what and how? Are we protected in some invisible way? I believe that we are. However, this is a good time for us to make sure we don't go too far with this lesson and put some things in context. The hedge offers spiritual protection rather than physical. God doesn't spare us from all trouble, from every piece of grief we might run into. We all deal with car accidents. We all deal with weather-related incidents. We can all get sick. In Ecclesiastes 9, verse 11, on the screen, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. So if we get a tornado here this afternoon, does that mean there's a hedge around us and the only houses that are likely to be destroyed will be the houses that belong to non-Christians? See, that would be taking the hedge work too far. We'd be taking it out of context. Time and chance happens to every man. But let's look at how God does hedge his vineyard today and this is one of the best scriptures in the Bible to confirm the hedge. It's found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 3. 
It's on the screen. I'm going to give you several scriptures here in rapid order, and they'll all be on the screen. But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. He protects us from the evil one to some extent. He's built a hedge around us like he did Job, just in a different way. Jesus said in back-to-back -back verses in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 28, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. That's the hedge work that God does today. Now that doesn't mean we can't be lost. It doesn't mean we can't sin against God. We can do the same thing that we read about in Isaiah 5, 5 moments ago if we choose to. We're free moral agents. But if we're doing our best to serve God, we can't be snatched out of the Son's hand. The very next verse in John 10, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. There's a look at the hedge work. It's so easy for us to see our physical blessings. Did you get a good night's rest last night? Did you wake up thankful to God that I got a good night's rest last night because I saw it, I felt it, I know I got a good night's rest last night and I ate a big boy breakfast and I thank God for that too. It's so easy for us to thank God for the blessings we see, but what about these invisible blessings? How many of us have ever stopped to give God thanks for the way He protects us from the evil one and from other types of evil experiences. This is something to be thankful for, a blessing we can't see, the hedge, spiritual protection. Here it is again on the board, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, God will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. There's more of the hedge that we're studying today. How does God know what we can bear? The Bible says He will not allow us to be tempted beyond what you are able well, how does God know what I, for instance, am able to bear? Because He's God, and He knows all things. How does He keep us from unbearable temptations? The hedge. God probably does a lot of things for us that we do not see or understand, because that's the complexity of the spiritual world. For example, let's go to the New Testament. We're going to come back to Job chapter 1 in a moment, if you mark that, please. Romans chapter 8. Now, this is not about the hedge. I just want to give you another example of how God works in our lives spiritually that we may not fully understand. These two verses I'm going to read, I don't have any hope that I will ever understand what this is. But here we go. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. How does the Spirit intercede? I have no idea. I just know that He does because God's will says He does. And I'm in favor of God's will. It sounds like a wonderful deal to me that the Holy Spirit has the power to intercede for me 
so that I pray for things that I've left out or I pray for things I don't know to pray for. It's another invisible spiritual blessing. He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And he helps in our weaknesses. You ever thought about that? How does the Holy Spirit help us in our weakness? How does He make intercession for us? How does He say things to God that I forgot to say or that I didn't have the knowledge to say? Trying to figure out the work of God in every way, shape, and form is virtually impossible. In the 66th Psalm, in the 5th verse, come and see the works of God. He is awesome in His doing toward the sons of man. God protects us from sinister forces through this hedge that He builds around us, much as He helps us with the interceding of the Holy Spirit. Here's another passage of Scripture. Philippians 4, verse 7, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. <clears throat> will protect you. Will hedge you from evil. You will be guarded through Jesus Christ. How does that work? Through faith. And how does faith work? Through the Word. And that's how God hedges us today, probably other ways too in His providence. But He hedges us today through the knowledge we have of the Word. Let's turn to the book of Acts in chapter 9. The Apostle Paul recants his conversion to Christianity three times in the history book of the New Testament. And this is the first. He ran into some peril that he couldn't deal with. Let's look at it. Acts 9, starting in verse 20. Paul, uh, Saul rather, spent some days with the disciples at Damascus and immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. And all who heard Paul were amazed and said, is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. You see, prior to this, Saul didn't need any help. I mean, we always need God's help. You know what I mean by that. But he can navigate this. He's a new Christian and he's preaching the gospel. He can take care of that. But now things have risen that are different from normal. There's a hot-blooded bunch of people that want to kill Saul. He's reaching into a different temptation right now. But their plot became known to Saul and they watched the gates night and day to kill him. And the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in a large basket. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, there he goes, the first phrase in verse 20. So they couldn't get him. They couldn't catch him. How was Saul spared from his own execution? God built a hedge around him. God's going to work through the providence of this scene, not allow you to get to Paul. And he works through knowledge. He works through the faith of faithful brethren. And after the Jews plotted to kill him, their plot became known to Saul. Saul has his head in the game. He's paying attention. And his fellow disciples took him by night. Here's a good idea. Where did you come up with that idea? Let's get a rope and let him down through the wall in a large basket. Why would you do that? Because earlier in the reading, they were plotting to kill him by watching the gates night and day. So let's do something tricky. Where did you get those thoughts? Where did you get those ideas? And how did you have the faith to come up with this plan? And Saul, next, we read about him. He's in Jerusalem, a long way from Damascus. That's a type of the hedge. 
God protected Peter in prison, Acts 12. Paul and Silas in the prison at Philippi with the miraculous earthquake. Joseph in Egypt. God has protected his people throughout time and he protects us today through his word. Let's go to the book of Ephesians. Now there might be some other things he does. I said that earlier. I want to make sure you understand that. His providence is awesome. He makes things happen for us to help us. But primarily what's going to make us strong and put a hedge around us is the knowledge we have of God's spoken word. Ephesians 6, 11 through 18. I'm going to start in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one, not just some of them, but all of them, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And I'm going to stop there. The word, obviously here, several indications in these readings that the word builds us up and keeps us out of harm's way and gets us prepared to do what? To quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, verse 16. The word directs our steps so that we might know right from wrong. Brother Peter, when he went to the high priest courtyard the night Jesus was betrayed, notice the sins he committed. He was in a bad company. He's surrounded by the Pharisees. These murderous thieves want to kill Jesus so bad they can hardly stand it. And he has deliberately put himself in harm's way by going to this place which no one told him to go to. And being in this place, bad company corrupts good character. Peter became a liar. Our own brother Peter, an apostle, became a liar. He became a deceiver. He denied the Christ three times. And he cursed. Now does that sound like Peter to you? Can you find any other place in Scripture where Peter told a lie? Where he cursed? Where he tried to deceive people. Now he made some mistakes and he was weak from time to time and he didn't believe the truth from time to time. But he didn't deliberately try to deceive anyone like he did in the high priest courthouse, courtyard. The word helps us stay out of bad places where we don't belong. Because those places are wrought with evil. And when we get into those places, we can bite off more than our humble hearts can chew. And Peter should have known, I don't belong in this place. This is a bad place. I'm clearly surrounded by bad people. And that's why we don't go to gambling halls. It's why we don't go to dance halls. It's why we don't go to taverns. We've been trained by the Word of God to know there are places out there we just don't belong, and that's the hedge God built around us through the Word. Here's a passage on the screen from Luke 11, verse 28. Jesus said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the Word of God and keep it. We can lose our hedge. Let's go to Isaiah. In chapter 22, 
We have to be careful about this hedge business that we don't take it for granted. Isaiah 22, 7 and 8. It shall come to pass that your choicest valleys shall be full of chariots, and the horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gate. God removed the protection of Judah. We'll stop right there. God removed the protection, the hedge that you used to have that protected you even though you couldn't see it and even though you may not have realized it, he's been protecting you all these years and now he's going to take that hedge away because you disobeyed God. I want to go back to Job. In chapter 1, we left off in verse 11. Before we read verse 12, I'd like to read verse 1 all over again. We can lose our hedge. Job never lost his. Patient Job was so faithful, he never lost his hedge. But notice what the Bible says in verse 1. He was blameless, upright, one who feared God, and shunned evil. How could he accomplish those things? without knowledge. He had a relationship with God. We don't know how. It was a long time before the prophets appeared and the Bible was written. But nonetheless, he knew God and he walked with God. He feared God and shunned evil. And that's how Israel lost its hedge. And that's why Isaiah shows us that. Job shows us that Job's hedge was maintained. Look at verse 12. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. God relaxed some of the hedge, it appears. Job is going to see some things from Satan. You know about the boils and he lost his children and his livestock. But God would not allow Satan, even then, to lay a hand on the man. 1 John 2.14 I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Young men, you've overcome the wicked one? How did you do that? How did mere mortals overcome Satan throughout time it's because God has protected His people with the Word. The Word of God abides in you, and that's how you have a hedge and have overcome the wicked one. Throughout time, God has protected His people by His Word. Nadab and Abihu lost their lives because they left the truth. What about Ananias and Sapphira? They lied to the Holy Spirit. They held back some of the money for themselves. And they lost their hedge and they lost their lives. We'll close right here. Genesis 15, 1. The hedge business goes way back. Abram, before he was named Abraham. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Let's give some thought to the hedge business. What has God protected us from? How thankful should we be? And can we remember to thank God for this invisible spiritual blessing? If you're in our audience today and subject to the invitation, if you need the prayers of this congregation, if you need to repent or confess sin or anything else we can do for you, please come to the front right now while we stand and sing.